Those of you watching from home, thanks for being with us this morning as well. Uh, I want to show you a picture here. If you were to come into the church parking lot and see that, you would ask yourself, what's going on? Why is there a balloon release happening? And the reason you would have seen those balloons is because of these people right here. They finished up their course uh, on Grief Share, which is one of the ministries that you help support through your offerings here in the church. Grief Share is a national ministry that helps people go through the time if they've lost a spouse, they've lost a, a child, uh, brother or sister, someone close to them where they are just reeling. They don't know what to do or how to, how to find up or down anymore. And just going through the, the difficulty of that transition, how do I get back to smiling again? How do I find meaning in life again? A grief Share is a wonderful support group that takes you through several weeks and gets you to a place. And we've had two or three sessions of this already in the last year or so. Uh, they just finished this group up, and they're so happy to, to get to go through this. It doesn't take away all the pain, but it helps you come at it from a Christian perspective to get you to a healthy place again. So if you're in a place where you realize, I could use that, or you know someone else who is, this is a free ministry we offer through the church, and we'll start one up again coming up uh, in the summertime. So just want to let you know about that. One of the things that you help make happen through your giving. Would you help me pray for the offering today? Jesus, as we come together this morning in worship, our hearts are already happy and filled with musical notes. Uh, thank you for this incredible team and their leadership and how they uh, each week inspire us and remind us that we are Christians who follow a great God and a merciful God, one who so loved the world. And as we try to continue that out through the week beyond Sundays in our church, all the different ministries that you allow us to do here in the campus, in the city, and around the world, Thank you for the generosity of this congregation that makes it happen. For all those who give and give deeply so that others can hear about Jesus and find healing, find hope, grow as disciples, go as missionaries in all the ways that you allow us to be your hands and feet in this world. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this morning, it's the week before Easter, and I want to do a little tune-up with you to get us ready for Easter. Uh, not so much on Palm Sunday. I'll cover that some other time. But today I want to talk with you about a topic called Into the Presence of Jesus. There's a story that happens in all three of the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And it's a story of some guys who have a paralyzed friend, and they bring him to Jesus, but they can't get into the house because it's so full of people, no one else can get in, and they have a guy on a stretcher. And so they end up getting very creative, taking him up onto the roof of the house, removing part of the roof, and lowering him down into the presence of Jesus. It's a fascinating story, and it has a lot of things I want us to think about today, and, and some very practical application as we look at that toward the end, too. So the question I want us to think about today is how many people's lives could be radically changed if we could just get them into the presence of Jesus? For each one of us that belong to Him, that's our story. We recognize there was a place in my life where I was separated from God. I didn't know who He was. I didn't understand. But then at some point, whether through a church service or a Christian friend or something I saw on TV or a song I heard, something kind of got through to me, and I finally understood who Jesus was. And I was ushered into the presence of Jesus, and I understood who He was, what He did for me, His love for me, His purpose and plan for my life, and I wanted Him. We all came to that place, those of us that have trusted Jesus. To get into His presence means you're going to be transformed. You're going to be changed. And we all know people that need that in our lives. And so this week, we're going to look at that. Easter's Easter, and then for the next eight weeks after Easter, we're going to walk through the Gospel of John and look at conversations that different people had with Jesus. His mother in chapter 2 at the wedding reception. Nicodemus in chapter 3, the woman caught in adultery in chapter 8, blind man in chapter 9, a whole bunch of different people that met Jesus and had conversations with him that came to him with needs that they had. And he not only answered their question, but he took them a whole lot deeper than they thought they would ever go, transforming interactions with Jesus. And we're going to look at this for about 10 weeks altogether, but this is going to be the start of it today about being in the presence of Jesus. If you have your Bible, I want you to turn with me to Mark chapter 2. Uh, that's the first one of these that we see. And we'll jump over to Luke a little bit in, in a while to get some more color for this. Mark kind of gives us a real quick black and white sketch of this story. So I'm going to read through it, and then we'll jump over to Luke and go a little bit deeper together. In Mark chapter 2, it says, When Jesus had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. And I want you to stop with me for a second and think about this. Yes, there's a verse in the Bible that says, that Jesus speaks and says, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head, the foxes and birds have nests and holes, but I don't have anywhere to lay my head. That was true while he was traveling around the country, yes. 
But many scholars believe Jesus actually did have a house that he lived in when he was back in Capernaum there. He was in his house. His father, more than likely, Joseph had passed away because we don't hear anything else about him from the time after Jesus is 13. It's just Mary left at the end of his story. And more than likely, Jesus would have taken on the role of the, of the older son in the family, taking care of his mother and brothers, whoever. And he would have had a responsible place. He would have had his own place. So if you've ever stopped to wonder in this story, if I were the person who owned the house, and I'm having a big Bible study in my house, and I've got this wonderful Bible teacher there named Jesus who's come to be my guest, and he's teaching a packed house full of people, and all of a sudden, somebody starts making noises up on the roof. What do you think I would do as the homeowner? If that were to happen here, now we know our building talks. It pops and things as the, as the sun goes up. We all know it makes these metal sounds, and there's all kinds of noises. It makes you nervous sometimes, especially in the hot summer. But if you were at your own house and you started hearing some terrible scratching, tearing, ripping noises on the ceiling, how many of you would just sit there and go, oh, well? None of us would do that. We'd say, hey, who are you? What are you doing on the roof? Get off of there. Somebody go see what's up there. None of us would just sit by and let someone tear a hole in the roof of our house. And that's why a lot of people think this house was Jesus' house. Isn't that interesting to think of that perspective as you start? He doesn't care about that because being human and God at the same time, he knows something really neat's about to happen. He's got a house full of people, but there's somebody who can't get in, and they're coming through the roof. They want to be here so badly. Jesus has got to be smiling, thinking, oh, this is going to be good. Even if he does or doesn't have the ability to see through walls, which he might, he's got to think, I can't wait to see who this is coming through the roof. This is going to be a great story. That's how it starts. One other thing I want you to notice, as this is going on, you can imagine there's going to be some sand and some silt and maybe some other things, roofing materials kind of just sifting down through the room. It's going to get messy. People are going to start <laughs> coughing and everything else as you have this construction project going on above your head. Ministry is messy. There are some people that can't stand to walk through a church and see something not just right. It, they're OCD and it drives them crazy. They, they want to go empty all the trash cans and wipe up all the coffee spills and things. Miss, ministry is just messy. If you ever have a youth ministry, you're going to have all kinds of things that are going to be different than it looked like before they got in the room. It's okay for ministry to be messy as long as people are getting into the presence of Jesus. Now, if you see something that needs to be fixed up, fix it up. Just don't get huffy about it. Just fix it up and smile and keep on walking. I stop and pick things up all the time around here, especially those little clear plastic mint wrappers. You guys just rip those open, throw them on the floor all the time. I'm always seeing those on the floor. It's messy, but you're in the presence of Jesus, so it's okay, and I forgive you, whoever you are. <laughs> Let's keep going. Verse 2. Many people, it says, are gathered together in this house so that there was no longer room, not even near the door. Jesus was speaking the word to them. He's teaching them something. It's so packed, you can't even get near the door. This is what we call a packed house, not room for one more person to fit in there. And they came, these four friends, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men, unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and when they had dug an opening, again, imagine just the, the noise and the dust and everything else going on, they let the pallet down on which the paralytic was lying. Four friends, each one's got a corner, they've got a rope, they're letting him down into the presence of Jesus. And Jesus, seeing their faith, says to the paralytic, not the four guys, but to them, son, your sins are forgiven. That's a wild statement. Some of the scribes that were sitting there in the house are reasoning in their hearts. They're thinking something. They're not saying it out loud. Jesus is reading their minds, which has to be really unnerving if you're sitting there. And he says, why? And he says I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? That's what they're thinking. He knows that. Immediately, Jesus, aware in his spirit that they're reasoning that way, within themselves, says to them, why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier for me to say? Your sins are forgiven or pick up your mat and walk away? Which is easier? He says, I could say either one. But so that you may know that the Son of Man, meaning Jesus, has authority on earth to forgive sins, he says to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. And the man got up, immediately picks up his pallet, went out in the sight of everyone. They all are witnesses to this miracle. So they're all amazed, and they're glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. 
I want to jump over to Luke's gospel because he gives us a little more detail, kind of puts some color to this story that makes it come alive even more. In Luke's version, chapter 5 of Luke, it says this, One day Jesus was teaching, and there were some Pharisees and teachers of the law, meaning scribes, that were sitting there. And it says they had come from every village around Galilee and from Judea and from Jerusalem. Now we know who's in the house. Most of these homes, if you put as many people as you could, you might get 40 or 50 people to fit into the house. And now we find out that a third, half, a big number of the people in the house are actually religious leaders, religious scholars, people that are, know all about the Old Testament. And as Jesus has begun to have a reputation, they want to find out who He is. We're going to look at this carefully. The fact that so many of them are there makes us wonder, why are they there? What's their agenda? They could be coming in curiosity like Nicodemus does, who just wants to find out who Jesus is, and really he ends up becoming a, a follower of Jesus. You'll see that in a few weeks. They could be coming with more sinister motives to try to trap Jesus by asking him questions because they did that all the time and it always blew up in their face. They could be coming with murderous intentions to want to remove him, and they actually do get to that place in his ministry where they want him dead. So we're not sure where they happen to be on the spectrum at this time, but their house is full of these guys. It'd be like me preaching to a bunch of seminary professors. Very, very intimidating to have that happen. I even know who the pastors are in our church that are retired, so I'm always a little nervous to make sure I get everything just right. So they'll go, ah, <coughs> that's not right. I don't ever want to have that happen in the middle of a talk. Never. This could be quite intimidating for Jesus if he weren't Jesus. He doesn't worry about that. He's there. We don't know why they're there. Is this man from God? Is he a threat to our power? They've got some agenda. We just don't necessarily see what it is. One thing they don't have yet, though, is faith. They don't believe in Him yet. They're curious. They might be conniving, but they don't believe in Him yet. The fact that there's so many of them, though, from so many towns and villages all around means this is an orchestrated effort. Somebody said, hey, Jesus is here. Let's go. And the word goes out. They're all on Twitter. They all show up at the same place. There they are to hear Jesus. Is He different? Or is he a threat? And then it tells us at the end of verse 17 that the power of the Lord was present for Jesus to perform healing, which means, spoiler alert, somebody's going to get healed in this house. We know that's coming. Some men were carrying on a bed a man who was paralyzed. In the Matthews version of this, he uses the word behold, which is one of our local experts. I have a friend in the congregation here that's a, a, a biblical scholar of his own right. And he gave me this really great fleshed out definition. When you see the word behold in the Bible, usually we think it means look, pay attention. But he says, let me give you a, a little longer translation. What's about to happen is so important that you will miss the whole point of this story if you don't pay attention to this. That's how important this is. Burn this image into your mind of what you're about to see, because this is what it's all about. Behold, these men are bringing a man on a bed to Jesus, and he is paralyzed. He can do nothing to help himself. And they're trying to bring him into the house to set him down in front of Jesus, because they want Jesus to heal him. They know Jesus can heal people. So we've got all of these spiritual seekers in the house. Some of them are religious scholars. Some of them are other curious people. Four faithful friends who are going to come through the roof to get this guy to the presence of Jesus, and one paralyzed man who cannot help himself. In the Gospels, Jesus often uses people that have physical problems, and he heals them to teach not just that he can heal, but also to teach a deeper spiritual truth. You have this story of the paralyzed man. He does it with the blind man in John chapter 9. He does it with the lame man also in John. He does it with deaf people that can hear. He does it with the bleeding woman. He does it with the dead person that he raises named Lazarus. And this man... He often uses people's physical things to say, not only can I heal you physically, but I can also heal you spiritually. These guys are coming in strong faith that Jesus can save their friend and heal his body. Verse 19 says, but not finding any way to bring him in because of the crowd. You can imagine how frustrating this is. It's almost like if you had a, your spouse that had a heart attack and you're trying to drive them to the emergency room and you can't get in the emergency room at the hospital because it's just full of people and you're yelling at the, at the intake people and saying, I've got, I've got someone who needs help right now. And they say, shh, we're busy. There's other people here before you. Get in line. Take a number. That's not what you want to hear. You're trying to save someone desperately and you can't get to the people who can help you. That's how it feels to these guys. They can't get in because it's too busy. It's too crowded. And they might be going, <clears throat> excuse me, excuse me, we're going to make, make, and no one moves. 
No one cares that this guy can't get in. They're all so focused on what they're there for that they can't see if someone else has a better and more stronger need than they do. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all paint a picture of Jesus as being an incredibly popular person at this point in his life. People find out where he's going to be, and they run to be there. He feeds 5,000 people. He goes away. They find out he's not there. They run around the lake to the other side to find where the boat went. They, they want to be in the presence of Jesus. That's what's happening. Everybody knows he can do things if they get there. But these guys can't get in. It's a packed house. And as, as a nation, they've been waiting 400 years since the end of Malachi for a God to show up again and speak and teach and heal. And now they think this might be it, and they can't get to him. It's so frustrating. But as they've made all this noise and commotion, they start lowering him down. Jesus speaks to, these, to this man on behalf of his friends, and he says, seeing their faith, the four, he says to the man, friend, your sins are forgiven you. Whose faith did Jesus see? Not the paralyzed man. He couldn't do anything to help himself. He sees the faith of the friends that believe if I can just get him in the presence of Jesus, Jesus can fix him. He can save him. He can heal him. How do you see faith? You can only see faith by what you do. That's what James tells us in his New Testament book. You can say you have faith all day, but show it to me by what you do. These guys showed their faith by bringing their friend to Jesus to get him saved. They had faith in Jesus. A whole room full of other people didn't yet. You see it by the actions. And God forgives the sins of this man who did nothing to earn it, and it's a great picture of all of us as we come before God. You and I have about as much ability to impress God with our goodness and righteousness and deservedness for heaven as a paralyzed person, which means we have none. We're all spiritually dead and paralyzed. We can't do anything to say, God, I deserve to go to heaven. We can't say that. We have nothing. He's a great picture of all of us. And as that happens, verse 21, the scribes and Pharisees, again, they're talking in their heads, who is this man who speaks blasphemies? He just told this man his sins were forgiven. Only God can do that. Every person knows that. Only God can forgive sins against that people have committed against him. No human can forgive another human for their sins against God. That's impossible. Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus is saying, mm-hmm. If you only knew who was in the house with you, only God can forgive sins. Jesus, thinking, knowing what they're thinking, looks at them and says, why are you reasoning this way in your hearts? Which is easier for me to say, your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? The idea of this, he's saying, is why are you having this dialogue in your mind? You know what's right, but you're, you're thinking the wrong way. You're, 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 you're missing it. It's the idea of this overly rational thought versus true feelings of knowing what's really right. You should sense, you should know that I am God in the flesh. You should know that. You're the religious experts, but you're not there yet. You don't have the faith that these four men had. He says, so here's how I'm going to show you who I am. Here's how I'm going to reveal to you who I am. This is that behold coming alive now, the part that you shouldn't miss. He says, I want you to know that the Son of Man, when he uses that phrase, Son of Man, he's tying himself back to Daniel, a promise of a Savior to come. He's coming. He's coming. The Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He says, I can do this because I'm Him. I'm the one that you've been waiting for. So he says to the paralytic, get up, pick up your stretcher, and go home. You don't need that thing anymore. How can Jesus prove that this man's sins are forgiven? He can only do that by healing him because they all can tell the man's paralyzed. And if he can heal him, he can then say, I can also forgive your sins. I can say I forgive your sins, but there's no way to prove that I did. But how about if I do a miracle in front of you? How about if I do a sign to signify that I am the one? Remember at the beginning of the story, God's power was present for Jesus to do a healing sign. It was there. So Jesus proves it by the miracle that he does and the sign that he does. And the response, go home and be a witness to what Jesus has done for you. Every time he had an encounter with a person, the idea was, now you go and tell other people. You go live out your life in such a way that other people want to come and get in the presence of Jesus too. That's what he consistently did with people. First, these faithful men bring their friend to Jesus who's paralyzed. Then that man who's been forgiven and healed and saved, he's going to go out. And the idea is you go tell your story and bring other people. It's what we call our testimony. Immediately, he obeys. You can tell he belongs to Jesus now because he doesn't argue. He just immediately gets up, picks up what he'd been lying on, and went home glorifying God. He is loud as he leaves the house. He's so happy to see this happen. There's instant obedience. There's glory to God. Verse 26 says, They were all struck 
with astonishment, just as we would be if we saw someone that we had all known for years was paralyzed, and all of a sudden they get up and walk out of the room. That just can't happen. You have witnessed a miracle. They knew that. And they begin glorifying God too, the people in the house. They're giving God praise. And it says they were filled with fear, saying, we have seen remarkable things today. When it says they were filled with fear, it means there is a holy hush. There is a sense of scaredness, of, of uh, awe, of we're in the presence of God right now kind of a moment. It was, it was scary for them. It was intimidating for them. They didn't know what to do with that. They knew God had just done something miraculous in their presence. God is among us. This man is the one we've been waiting for all this time. And there's a sign that's just been done to prove that to us. Jesus is divine. God is among us. Now, friends, this is our story, too. This is our story, too. The presence and the teaching of Jesus are here in this church. Many people come in and say, I feel the Holy Spirit of God here. I feel the love. I feel the acceptance. I feel like this is a place where God is. We've, many people tell us that. We teach from the Bible verse by verse. You, you, get, you get the Word of God. People are coming and sitting in chairs because they want to be in the presence of Jesus. They want to grow. They want to learn. They want to become who Jesus wants them to be. That's happening here too. We want more of Jesus. We want to be more like Jesus. We want Jesus living in us and through us. And we can often forget as we gather and kind of pack out the house, and next week it'll be like that for sure with Easter, we can forget that there are paralyzed people out there that need to get in here. We can forget that we need to be those faithful friends who go out there and get them and bring them here. We can forget that we need to be sensitive to the fact that they're trying to get in the presence of Jesus and maybe we're taking their parking spot or we're taking their chair and we need to learn a very sensitive graciousness to say, oh no, you first. You come in first. You have a greater need. You come on in and be a part of that for us. Those of you that were here about a year and a half ago in July 2020 uh, came and preached the first sermon here coming in view of a call and I preached on Zacchaeus, the story of Zacchaeus, that little man who was trying to get close to Jesus because he needed Jesus. He needed to get in the presence of Jesus too. And remember the same thing was true. He couldn't get to Jesus because he was too short. He couldn't see him, so he had to climb a tree so he could see Jesus. And Jesus knew there was a divine appointment that day as well. He called Zacchaeus to come down and go to his house, and they had lunch together. And Zacchaeus was transformed. Same kind of picture. Sometimes we can be so enjoying ourselves amongst our Christian friends in the presence of God that we forget there's somebody behind me I need to turn around and see that needs to be in the presence of Jesus even more than I do. We have to live lives as Christians that are convicting and, and compelling and challenging to people so that they want what we have. That's true. People need a reason to believe in Jesus and if they can see our changed life that gives them something to look forward to. They need to see also that we're willing to go to extreme measures to tear a hole in the roof to get them in the presence of Jesus. These four friends didn't just dig a hole in the roof and leave, G leave the guy out on the ground and say, all right, buddy, we did a part of it. You do the rest. He's paralyzed. They didn't dig a hole in the roof and leave him up on the roof and say, okay, all you have to do now is roll over and fall down. Didn't do that either. They didn't just say, look out below and toss him in the room. They gently lowered him into the presence of Jesus. There's a graciousness here. There's a thoughtfulness here that says we want you to be right in Jesus' lap, into his presence. So I want you to think with me, that person in your life that you care for that doesn't know Jesus yet, they desperately need to get into his presence. It's a relative, it's a coworker, it's a friend, it's a neighbor, somebody that needs to get in Jesus' presence. They need that. We are the ones who want to welcome them into that presence of Jesus Holy Spirit has to do His part. He re regenerates our hearts. He brings people from that spiritual paralysis to, to receptiveness so that we can trust Jesus. We know that. No one comes to the Lord on their own. There's a partnership. God does His part, and He often works through us, being those friends that are faithful to bring people to Him. He does that too, and it's such a joy that He lets us be a part of that story. With Easter coming next weekend, how can each one of us Provide people with that opportunity to come into the presence of Jesus in a way that helps them have access to Jesus, to see Him, to experience Him. How do we tear a hole in the roof for people? I want to challenge you to start praying now for all the people that are going to come next weekend. God's Spirit to be working in them, that they would be receptive to what He wants to say to them. I want you to practice what we call situational awareness. We live in a world where if you're in any parking lot, you have to watch out not just for the people 
that are going out to their cars, but for the people that are doing this, walking around like zombies with their eyes on their phone. They have no idea where they are. They don't know what traffic's coming or anything else. But we need to practice situational awareness on the church campus. That when you see somebody, if you don't know them on a first-name basis, the most natural thing for us to do then is to go up to them and say, Hi, I don't think I've met you before. You share your name, you invite them to know your name, and you, and you walk with them to the building. And you say, is this your first time here? And they say, no, I come every Easter. That's fine. They might say that. Or they might say, yeah, I've been here 12 years. That could happen too. Or they might say, no, I'm just here for the first time. Whatever the answer is, have fun with them. Come on in. Let me, let me get you a cup of coffee. If you need a restroom, they're right down the hall. Here's where we check in the babies, children's classes, all the things they need to know. Let them have what they need. Be their personal tour guide. Take them through that. Be the one that lowers them into the presence of Jesus. Every week, there are new people here between the three services. We're constantly getting new, which is wonderful to have. And we want to make sure they have a gracious welcome to our place. You want to invite people. We have little business cards that are invite cards that have all the service times for Easter weekend on them. Grab some of those today. Hand them out to people that you know. I want to challenge you to do something else. I want you to arrive early. You know how Easter is. Parking lot's going to be a mess. We know that. I want to challenge you. So we had a wonderful man in our church. He attends Saturday night service. He asked his wife for a weed eater for Christmas. She got him a nice one, good brand. It's got a harness on it where he can, has these handlebars like he's riding a motorcycle. He can get out there. He, if you notice, the entire top of our property, he trimmed all of it over about the last 10 days. So now you can park your cars up there in anticipation of Easter. He gave up a whole week of his life to weed eat just so that you and I can be kind, and we're going to park as far away from the building as we can. Now, if you have a real reason why you can't drop off your spouse, use the golf carts, that's fine. But I want to challenge you, park as far away from the building as you can. Get here early so you can park far away so someone else can have a closer spot. And a warning, don't you dare park in guest visitor parking if you're not a guest or a visitor. <laughs> Going to have AAA towing on site. <laughs> Pat Carney's in charge of that team. Going to be standing there with his arms crossed and a checkboard. I know you. You've been here for 12 years. Get out of here. Go park somewhere else. Shame on you. Don't you do that. Don't do it on Easter. Don't do it either Sunday. You can just kind of walk a shame out tonight if you're parked there. Don't ever do that again. Those spots are for the people that need to get in the presence of Jesus. Don't park in a guest parking spot. I admit I used to do it when I first came because nobody was parking over there, but now we have a better problem. We have people parking there, so I don't do that either. I admit it. Could have towed me too. Invite people to sit near you if you meet them for the first time. Hey, why don't you come sit in our row? You don't have to sit right next to them. That can be a little creepy, but come sit in our row. Give them an empty chair so they feel a little safe. Make sure they get a newsletter of what's going on. We're going to try to have the main newsletter ready for them to pick up when they're here this next weekend. And when it's all over, invite them to come back the next week. Love to see you again. If I can answer any questions for you, let me know. I've been here a while. All right. I'm going to have a meet the pastor thing Wednesday night right after Easter. If people want to come and get to know more about me or the church, we'll have that too. Make it easy and just let them, hey, we're going to have a great sermon series coming up on people that met Jesus and the conversations they had with Jesus for about eight weeks after Easter. It's going to be a wonderful series to just understand all the ways people can connect with Jesus. It's going to be so much fun. So as you think about it, we need to be a congregation that says we're willing to go to extreme measures of graciousness and thoughtfulness and kindness to tear a hole in the roof to get everyone who comes into the presence of Jesus because Jesus will change their life just like he changed ours. We know that's true. And that's our challenge as we step into Easter next weekend. I want to share with you a little bit about the gospel real quick here. The book of Romans is fascinating. The apostle Paul gives us the theme verse of Romans in chapter 1, verse 16. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, for the Jew first and then to the non-Jews, for the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Just like those four men who had faith that Jesus could do, he says, we have to have faith in Jesus too. Goes on in Romans 3 and says, we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of God's, God's glory. But we're justified by God's grace as a gift through the redemption that's in Christ. God displayed him publicly as a perfect payment on the cross to satisfy the wrath of God against sin. In his blood through faith. Once again, faith that Jesus is who he says he is. In Romans 5, he says, Therefore, having been justified by our faith in Jesus, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, in Romans 8, he says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who could be against us? He didn't even spare his own son, but he delivered him over for us all. 
how will he not also freely give us all things? That's our God. The message of the Bible is very simple, that we have to put our trust in Jesus as our Savior. Jesus can heal us from our sins. He can sometimes choose to heal us from other physical things too. He can do whatever he wants, but he will give us all good things. He wants to make all things new in our life. That's what we're going to talk about next week for Easter, that he makes all things new. His death and resurrection changes the trajectory of all of our lives for now and for forever. It's going to be a fantastic time to enjoy together. Well, let's look at our salvation prayer as we wrap up this morning. When we say, Lord Jesus, today I trust you. We mean I I put my faith in you, my hope, my confidence. I, I receive you as my Savior. You are who you say you are, Jesus. We don't want to be like those scribes and Pharisees in the room, curious, maybe conniving. We don't want to be those people. We want to be like the four that came with faith that Jesus saw their faith and healed someone's life. Let's pray. Jesus, today I trust you. Put my faith in you. I accept your forgiveness for our sins. Thank you for dying on the cross and being the perfect payment for our sin. That when God sees a rebellious humanity, he is perfectly justified to be angry and wrathful against that rebellion. But you came as the mediator. You came and died. Perfect God, perfect man that God was among us, and you went to the cross and died and paid a perfect price for our sins to be forgiven. Would you now fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we can listen to you and obey you and be aware when you're speaking to us? Would you teach us from your Bible so we're conformed to the image of Jesus and help each of us to live our lives the way you want us to from now on as people who are willing to do extreme things, to tear a hole in the roof and to bring others into the presence of Jesus. Amen. Give everything you have as a worshiper. Be extreme about it. Grow as a disciple. Have that faith and go everywhere as a missionary, even if that means you carry people into the presence of Jesus like they did in the story. I want to remind you to always try to come early or stay late to pray, to get your heart ready for worship or stay after with Michael. He's going to be down here praying. You can come and just focus on what you heard today and think about what does God want to say to me as you pray. This week you have a chance to serve with us. If you look in your top right corner of your bulletin, there's a lot of places you can go to be a part of the hands and feet of Jesus here in San Antonio. I encourage you to come and volunteer and pray there with us. If you're a guest with us this morning, we've got a welcome center just outside these doors. We'd love to give you a free gift just for coming. It's one of our ways to say thank you. We'd love to get you connected to our our, uh, emails and communications so you know what's happening each week. If you haven't done this yet, Go to our church website, scroll to the very bottom of the front page, and there's a place there for you to put your email into a little box. When you do that, you'll start receiving a a, a weekly Wednesday reminder of here's what's coming up next. We try to do some fun videos to make it fun for you. Uh, Here's what's coming next, so you'll get to see what's up in the weekends to come so you don't miss anything. And reminder for you guys, we have our Servant Warrior Weekend coming up end of April, first part of May, up at Camp Eagle. It's an incredibly beautiful place, right at the headwaters of one of the rivers here in Texas. Beautiful campsite, great place to get away, and a wonderful worship and speaker. I encourage you to sign up and be a part of that with us. You get a bunch of great meals. This is one camp I can vouch for. The food is fantastic. When you think of summer camps, you usually think of having to smuggle in some Snicker bars to get through the week. Not this place. They feed you well. You will come back fatter, I promise, guys, if you go. It's going to be good for you. Well, if you'll stand with me, I want to give you our benediction this morning. This is from Paul speaking to his friend Philemon. It's one of the most persuasive letters ever written in human history. And he says to his friend Philemon, I hear of your love and the faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. And I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for the sake of Christ. For I have had great joy and comfort in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. I want you to hear that as if Paul were speaking that to each of you this morning, that he he hears about your love. He hears about the faith you have in Jesus toward all the saints, and he's praying for the fellowship of our faith to become effective through what we know about Jesus and every good thing that he's put in us, that we bring all that to the table, and he would find great joy and comfort in our love as well because our hearts are refreshing other people as we bring them into the presence of Jesus. Thanks for worshiping with us this morning.